10,000 people shouting racist abuse or call, you know, uh, throwing bananas on the pitch or monkey chants. I didn't feel it was part of the job, no. Um, it's not what I signed up for. The black thing never came into my head one bit. It was about being a professional footballer. There were some insulting things that were said and things that were done, but you have to put that in the back of your mind, be strong, and just go and do what you have to do. Because, like I always tell people, the soccer ball doesn't care what colour you are. Football's history has long been laced with incidents of racial abuse, decades where banana throwing and monkey chants were nothing out of the ordinary. It's a sport that started with the working man, capable of reflecting society in both the best and the worst ways. Today, the attitudes in the sport have changed, with teams full of players from around the world. But despite all of the progress on the pitch, allegations of racism and prejudice still continue to surface. At the end of last year, Chelsea's John Terry was accused of allegedly using a racial slur against Queen's Park Rangers' Anton Ferdinand. Terry has pled not guilty, but was stripped of his England captaincy and will stand trial in July. And Liverpool's Luis Suarez was banned for eight matches by the Football Association when he was found to have racially abused Manchester United's Patrice Evra. Suarez maintains that he did nothing wrong. Two high-profile cases bringing back the spotlight to racism in football. And England, as football's birthplace, is committed to solving it, while trying to move past a history that's hard to forget. Its shores blanketed with pink sand, washed over in a dazzling blue. Bermuda, a remote island, barely more than 35 kilometers from end to end, is the unlikely birthplace of a trailblazer among black footballers. To see games in those days, you had to go to the movie hall and get it on a sports reel. Um, I had seen Tottenham play in a European game probably in the early 60s, and I knew then, once seen it, that was a life for me. It was more than 40 years ago that Clyde Best left the picturesque for the pitch, beginning a life he'd envisioned from an early age. Best began playing here at the Somerset Cricket Club, one of the few football clubs on the island, and eventually captured enough attention to play for the Bermuda national team at the age of 16. At the time I was coming along in Bermuda, football was at a very high standard. We had some very, very good players, and I was able to emulate what I saw a lot of those players doing and was able to take it to England. And I've always believed if you can play on these fields here, going to England was going to be a double. Ron Greenwood, West Ham United's manager and one of England's finest coaches, decided to bring on Best as a hammer in 1969, when he was just 18. I was over the moon because um, when you think about it, um, England had just won the World Cup in 66. Here I am a year and a half later and rubbing shoulders with people that had just won the World Cup. Ron Greenwood was tremendous, one of the best coaches I've been with football-wise, you know, was able to get us to do the right thing and I always tell people if you play at West Ham, you can play anywhere in the world. The boy from Bermuda was finally going to get a taste of what he'd seen on TV all those years ago. I think the first time I went to Man United and I saw the crowd, it made you think and sit up because here I am coming from a little place like Bermuda and they got 50, 60,000 people in the stadium. You know, that was bigger than the population of Bermuda at the time. And it made you realize, you know, how fortunate you were to play in front of those people. When Best first arrived on the scene, not only were there few black footballers, but the racial tension in England was tangible. 
On June the 22nd, 1948, the arrival of the Empire Windrush, carrying hundreds of men from the West Indies, marked the beginning of mass immigration. And years later, communities were still trying to adjust to the new racial makeup of neighborhoods. The number of non-whites in England climbed from just a few thousand in 1945 to about 1.4 million by 1970. And in 1968, the conservative politician Enoch Powell warned of rivers of blood because of immigration. As they con continue to multiply and as we can't retreat further, there must be conflict. So the stage was set as Best found himself in a position where he not only needed to prove himself as a footballer, but as a black footballer. Well, I think with television just coming into play at that time, there was a lot of attention and, you know, people were watching to see what you're going to do, if you're going to make it, uh, because at that time a lot of people in England would say that, you know, we couldn't play in the cold weather and stuff like that. So you had a, a reputation to uphold and show them that conditions don't matter. With his striker's instincts and a name like Best, the headlines came easily. What probably fooled a lot of people, they looked at my size, but they never realized how quick I was. And I think that put a lot of people off, you know. Um, they thought that, hey, here's a big guy, he can't run. But as I've always said, you give me a half a yard, I'm going to hurt you. But some fans, even West Ham fans, cared more about his colour, delivering vicious racial taunts. They started what we call the monkey chant. And that was, you, know, you knew that was only directed at you because I'm the only black fellow on the field. One of the incidents that would always stick in my mind was I got a letter in the mail one day and we were playing at home. I can't remember the particular team, but uh, the letter stated that as I ran through the tunnel, they were gonna throw acid in my face. Oh, I was petrified, and I probably never moved so much and on a soccer field so fast in my life because that was in the back of your mind. And the police that were there, the manager, they arranged it, you know, the, so that you know I was able to get through as quickly as possible and not have that incident occur. But um, it wasn't a nice thing, and uh, you know, you don't want those sort of things happening to nobody. You know, but it was hard, it was tough, and I found most times the best way to silence most of the people was to put, put the ball in the back of the net. I never set out to be a pioneer, because when you're playing professional sports, you just want to play. You don't look and see what's going to happen 20, 30, 40 years down the road. People weren't used to seeing people of color on the field in those days. And I always was taught that, hey, you're not playing for yourself. You're playing for the people that are coming behind you. And that's what kept me going. As I say, there were certain certain things that were said and things that were done, but you have to put that in the back of your mind, be strong, and just go and do what you have to do. Because like I always tell people, the soccer ball doesn't care what color you are. You know, you just play. Best played 218 games for West Ham, scored 58 goals, but more importantly, he helped change the face of the game. Racism in football has infiltrated many countries outside of England, with incidents continuing to happen all over the world. But one of the most memorable was with Cameroonian Samuel Eto'o. A stop in play during the 77th minute, as Barcelona striker Eto'o has clearly had enough of the racial abuse that the crowd has been showering down on him all match. It's a memorable moment, as you can see Eto'o saying, no mas, no more and he goes to walk off the pitch as players from both sides coax him to stay in the game. In that moment, you start thinking whether there is something wrong with being black, you know? But I think we are all humans, everyone blood is the same color, and we all have the same heart. I don't see any differences in skin color.
England. Ball. To people here, it's more than a sport. It's an identity, a way of life. And to some, a religion. I think it's a strange beauty football. I mean, most sports uh, are played with your hands. Your hands are quite dex dexterous. But when you play football, it's with your feet. And it gives you a strange beauty when you are um, controlling that ball, manipulating that ball, uh, passing that ball. And when you have that flowing movement uh, within a team, within a context of competition, it's just a fantastic, uh, fantastic sport. It is a global game. It is the most watched game in the world. Um, there, it, it brings so much to you your life that people, are, it's all consuming. On this night, supporters of the Luton Town Football Club stream steadily into the stadium, bundled up, ready to stick it out for 90 minutes. There's a passion for this game that can come out in all forms, but with recent attention on allegations of racism from fans and players alike, it has raised the question of how this can possibly still exist and if the answer lies in how football was born and raised. The Football Association, England's governing body, was founded in 1863 at the Freemasons Tavern in London, creating the structure for what would become the most popular sport in the world. It was the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in England and so workers were attracted to the big cities and uh, workers had the Saturday afternoon off and it became their recreation. A real working class sport, football could be played almost anywhere with just a ball and a patch of space. You know, you get ball and people come together um, from you know, wherever. You know, when, I was, when I was a kid growing up, all the boys used to get together and make two goals. Didn't matter where you was from. You know, at times there were 20, 20 v 20 on, the, on this, on this grass, grass village playing football. So um, you know, it, just, it just brings everybody together and that's why it's so universal. The huge popularity of football has given it influence far beyond that of any sport. And that can be a double-edged sword, as obsessive fandom can express itself in dangerous ways. Well, I think there are a number of reasons why football, perhaps over cricket or rugby or some other sports that are popular in England, is a fertile ground and has been previously a fertile ground for some of this activity, whether it's the roots in the working class or whether it's the tribalism that comes with football that you don't quite get with other sports. I think those prejudices come to the fore in a way that's completely unacceptable. English football fans developed an ugly and violent reputation in the 1970s and 80s, running amok across Europe. On May the 29th, 1985, at the Heysel Stadium in Brussels, fans of the Italian team Juventus tried to escape from English supporters before the European Cup final. 39 people died, most of them crushed to death. 600 were injured. Football hooliganism had become a national problem. English clubs were banned from European competition for five years, a measure British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher supported. You know, supporters have a team and, you know, need to support their team and are very aggressive against anybody or other supporters. But I would like to think that that culture is diminishing and there's a much more civilised culture being developed. But that can only be done with, with education and understanding. Football had become a mirror of society, giving people an outlet to express their frustrations over immigration and the economy and many times their prejudices followed not too far behind. When individuals are in a, in a mob situation, they can lose themselves. Uh, ordinary people who probably wouldn't charge so many things, stuff like that, uh, in the club mentality, having a few beers, uh, it's easy to, to, to pick on uh, one or two black guys on the, on the pitch. But black players would continue to fight through the prejudices, confronting it head on, making their mark on football history. In the 1920s, he was a rare face in football. Jack Leslie, who was born in London to Jamaican parents, was a midfielder for Plymouth FC, scoring more than 130 goals in 400 matches. During his time with Plymouth, Leslie would regularly receive racial abuse. But for him, 
There was no greater insult than when he was denied a spot on England's team. His manager told him one day that he'd be picked to play for England, but he never did. The Football Association, which selected the team, did not realize that he was, quote, a man of color. Viv Anderson, a defender for Nottingham Forest, started his career in 1974, right on the heels of Clyde Best. Very elegant, very elegant uh, uh, right, right back, uh, very, very good player, very proficient, played for the top clubs, and the first uh, black person played for England. To see Viv Anderson uh, rise through that and play great football for a great team at, at Notts Forest uh, and receive uh, his first cap was fabulous. It was in the 70s that black players slowly started to dot the dominantly white team photos. There certainly wasn't many black faces about, you know. Um, I remember being an apprentice, I was only an apprentice for a very short while before I signed pro and uh, you had to knock on the dressing room door before you, you had to come in and you had to say nice things to the senior professionals and, uh, and I'd, I'd say, uh, who's at the door? And I'd say, it's Mr. It's Anderson. They'd say, get out there, you little black cat, you know, jokingly, but there were, you know, some right funny comments at the time. But luckily enough, I was at a club that were very provincial and they were very, very good for me and uh, they helped me in my career. But even as they became more commonplace, immigration in England hadn't slowed, sustaining much of the racial tension of previous decades. From 1968 until 1975, 83,000 immigrants from the Commonwealth came to England. In 1972, Ugandan dictator General Idi Amin forced 80,000 African Asians out. 28,000 of them flooded into England within two months. The fabric of cities like London, Liverpool, Manchester and Leicester was changing. And from their schools, a new generation of footballers was emerging. Anderson was born and raised in Nottingham. But at some grounds, fans treated him as anything but English. One day, just before a game, coach Brian Clough told him to warm up. I think it was sub that day, and uh, he said warm up. I warmed up and uh, I was back down, sat back next to him within five minutes and he said to me, uh, thought I told you to warm up. I said, I have been warming up, but they've been throwing bananas and pears and everything at me. He said, uh, get back out there and warm up and then get me a couple of pears and an apple, please. And he made light of it at the time. I didn't actually get on at the game, but he pulled me afterwards and said, listen, if you want to make a career for yourself, you have got to get over these things or put them out of your mind because in future, I'm going to pick somebody else. If I think you're going to be affected by people that same pe people say things, and in, in in whether they're players or whether it be supporters, you ain't going to make a career. And I can't rely on you on a Saturday afternoon or a Wednesday or whenever we play. So uh, from that day on, I just dismissed everything. It was about playing and and trying to make the best of uh, what I, the ability I had. You know, you don't want one person or a several individuals chant chanting one thing that makes somebody else go off the football field. We don't want that. We want to see and be entertained. You come here on a Saturday afternoon to be entertained, and I think that's, that, that's the fundamental thing. In 1976, England decided to take discrimination into its own hands, creating the Commission for Racial Equality that would enforce the anti-discrimination laws. It was a step in the right direction. But the symbolic step in football came on November the 29th, 1978, Viv Anderson became the first black player to be capped by England. To play for your country in front of 100,000 people at home, it's a matter of personal pride to make sure you put in a decent performance. The black thing never came into my head one bit. It was about being a professional footballer and wanting to be in the next squad, the next team, the next whatever. It was a hard game, we won 1-0, we managed to win, so, you know, to win on your debut, it's just a great, great feat. And uh, all I can say is, I, I mean, I, I tried to do my best, uh, I enjoyed my time for England and um, I just hope for it made it easier because uh, obviously you see a black face on a, on a telly playing and you think, oh, I can achieve that. Hopefully Paul Ince and you know, the others that's come along after me, they say, well, he did it, I don't see why I can't and hopefully I've helped in that way. With each new black player, the road got a little easier and soon there would be players who didn't have to go at it alone.
Jamaican-born midfielder John Barnes is the subject of a disturbingly iconic image. A banana is thrown at him as he casually backheels it away. One reporter said, racism, symbolically undone with wit, skill and panache, the banana no longer carried any terrible political potency. Four years earlier, Barnes had scored a wonder goal for England against Brazil in Rio, only to be taunted on the plane coming home by a group of neo-Nazi supporters. His goal didn't count, they claimed. It was one team, for one season, with three special players. We were the first team in a tough flight to play three black players on a consistent basis. But also we were a very good team with some excellent individuals. They were West Bromwich Albion's triple threat, and manager Ron Atkinson had the perfect nickname for them. For those who don't know Ron, he's not the shyest of persons. Um, great self-publicist. Uh, one of the top female groups around was a group called the Three Degrees and we got nicknamed the Three Degrees. To this day, um, people still refer to us as the as Three Degrees. Each player with his own style. The striker, Cyril Regis. Cyril um, was just a breath of fresh air. Some of the things you saw him do, he, he'd taken all the stuff he'd learned from non-league and really just uh, did exactly the same thing in the, um, in the top flight. The defender, Brendan Batson. Brendan was, uh, you know, uh, I think, Play for us, uh, a bit quite old than us, but he was uh, part of the really good back four at West, uh, West Brom. Uh, a great defender, uh, a very knowledgeable, intelligent defender. And the winger, Laurie Cunningham. Laurie was great on the eye. Most players, black players, the second generation, would cite Laurie as, as their role model purely because, you know, he. He had the style, he had the pace, he had the grace, uh, and he had the, the flair, uh, which captivates everybody's hearts. We, we used to get in early for training and leave late because he didn't want to didn't leave. The, the banter in the dressing room was terrific, albeit we didn't win anything, but it was a, it was a joy week in, week out to play in such a, an exciting side. Uh, the West Brom fans were fantastic. They took to us fantastically, uh, supported us, appreciated us. Uh, but at the end of the day, they want anybody out there to play football, and we play football well in, in I would say, uh, a, a very, very good side at West Brom in the late 70s. As the three degrees found their place in football, the National Front, a far-right political party opposed to immigration, was recruiting among the skinhead gangs that followed many of the top clubs. The atmosphere was intimidating. Football and sport should be a pleasure and it had stopped becoming a pleasure. It was intimidating, it was almost like gang warfare. There was trouble on the streets, there was trouble at the grounds. It was that, like a pack at times of wild dogs. It wasn't, it wasn't what football or sport should be about. Obviously coming from the 70s, uh, it was uh, after the winter of discontent and there's still like racial tensions around about, you know, the foreigners coming to the country and having our jobs. Uh, and to see three black, three black lads playing football um, it was an easy target, easy target for th those ideas to come to fore. People have said to me that as black players started to come to the fore in the early 70s in numbers, that was almost an opportunity for the um, National Front to, to come out and vent their fury at black players because they're within a stadium, they have the cloak of anonymity in terms of their numbers and they could say what they want, the football authorities did nothing about it. So for, uh, for the black players coming through, and particularly when I was at West Brom with Laurie Sherman and myself, we seemed to get the, the brunt of it because there were three of us. And I mean, the volume was, was quite astonishing at times. It was a bit of a shock to me, having come from Cambridge, to suddenly come and have 20, 30, 40, 50,000 within a stadium and a great, a significant minority really drowning out anything else and you could hear all the racist chanting. It wasn't pleasant. You got 10,000 people shouting racist abuse or calling, you know, throwing bananas on the pitch or monkey chants or all sorts of things. Of course, you are aware of it. When I was at Cambridge, in actual fact, and uh, we were playing Bradford uh, away, and it just so happens that day there was um, a National Front rally up there. I didn't, I, I didn't know. It isn't something I, I would follow, obviously, but um, we were playing Bradford, <clears throat> and I was getting a lot of stick from the crowd. And it, because it's sparse, sometimes you can actually see the person who's actually giving you the abuse. And um, as the ball was being thrown back to me from the crowd, I could pick this bloke out, called me all the names under the sun. 
and I think I had, um, you could almost call it Eric Cantona moment, where I was going to just throw the ball into his face if I could. And I think I was in the process of doing it when I just felt a hand on my, on my arm and his Scottish voice said, tell me, get on with the game, Brendan. And it was the assistant manager, John Dock. I think he spotted that I was about to do something a bit silly. You go from one or two people calling you racist names or walking down the, walking down the streets or seeing things or uh, having your odd fight at school to, you know, maybe five to 10,000 people shouting, nigger, nigger, lick my boots. Uh, so we really stepped up on another level, but, uh, but we dealt with it. We dealt with it. During the 1978-79 season, West Brom was near the top of the league. So, for the three degrees, the best revenge was simply winning. We were playing some very, very exciting football. Um, and we were always in the top three, basically, for, for most of that season. And really, we can stick our fingers up to those um, you know, spectators who were delighting in calling us all the names under the sun. And we were really pleased that we could go to their grounds, you know, um, particularly away from home, and uh, show them what we were about and taking the points from them. Our coping mechanism in all of us was, was we internalised that anger. We said, right, how can we get back at you? We can only get back at you by the way you play football. So we used it as motivation. And I just used that as motivation to go out and play better. Um, it gave us a great deal of satisfaction that we could turn around and say, hang on a minute, we're good players and uh, we'll see you again. And by the way, we've beaten your team. West Brom finished that season in third place. Laurie Cunningham was sold to Real Madrid for £1 million, an astonishing sum in those days. Sadly, in 1989, the Three Degrees lost one of their own when Cunningham was killed in a car crash. I think they were the trailblazers, weren't they? I think um, they had to... Um, they, were, they, were, they were together, but on their own, if you know what I mean. It was just them, and that was it. And so they had to, they had to keep strong together, um, and they really had to endure you know, lots of racial abuse, and no doubt at times physical abuse because of, the, because of their colour. They just showed that, yeah, we are black, we're proud, and we are going to be successful. And they were successful, and they, they showed it in that way. Growing up, didn't see many black players. So when you don't see many black people in an industry, it's an industry that you feel might be cut off to. And it was only till I got a little bit older that, you know, I remember seeing the, the, the likes of the late Lloyd Conan and Sil Regis, Ben Batson, and players like that playing that made me think to myself, well, maybe there is something I could do as a, as, as a career. More than 20 years after black players began appearing for English clubs, after all of their sacrifices, the law was finally being mobilised to protect them. New laws were brought in to help prosecute racial assaults and abuse, and the 1991 Football Offences Act made racist chants at football games a criminal offence. What became an irony is that while supporters accepted their own black players, they would have a got black players on the opposition teams, and so it, it has needed a, a long process of a combination of factors to improve matters, and that's, that's the whole country appreciating that racism is wrong. But England wouldn't stop there. The law wasn't enough. There was more to be done. Crowd chants, both racial and homophobic, descended on Portsmouth defender Sol Campbell. Then Portsmouth manager Harry Redknapp described it as filthy. Police publicly released suspect photos captured by the closed-circuit TV system to help find the guilty parties involved. In his court statement, Sol Campbell said he felt totally victimised and helpless. Eleven people were eventually arrested. The Crown Prosecution Service said this was the first case of indecent chanting to be brought to the courts. All seems quiet outside of this stadium. And the eyes in the sky surrounding the grounds make sure it stays that way. So here at the American Express Community Stadium, we've got a state-of-the-art CCTV system, really important. It gives us that facility that we can zoom in onto an area reported to us and we can um, pinpoint that area. Chris Baker is the safety officer for Brighton and Hove Albion Football Club. As the safety officer for the club, I'm basically responsible for the whole of the match day operation. So that runs down to the stewarding, security, uh, medical provision, 
um, and, and everything to do with the running of a, a successful event. As one of the newest stadiums in the league, its closed circuit television system is a prime example of how technology can be an essential tool for combating abusive behaviour. We have 75 cameras spaced around the ground and should any racist abuse be reported to us, we can very quickly potentially get one, two, maybe three cameras onto an area. If you look to the left in the west stand raised high, there's a camera that looks perfectly down into my seat. Uh, if someone sat in this seat and chose to use racial behaviour, racial language, antisocial language um, or even homophobic language, then the camera could zoom in closely on their face uh, and a lip reader could potentially use it in a court of law to prosecute them. CCTV was implemented by clubs shortly after the Hillsborough disaster on April the 15th, 1989. During an FA Cup semi-final match between Liverpool and Nottingham Forest, an overflow of fans were forced through a narrow tunnel, crushing people in the front of the stands. 96 people died, 766 injured. It's the deadliest stadium disaster in British history. An inquiry later determined that a failure of police control was partly responsible. But the disaster made people realise that stadiums needed to be safer. Well, clubs had to act on it. The clubs had to buy into, they didn't have to, but they did buy into an anti-racism programme, particularly when Lord Justice Taylor, with his report on the Hillsborough disaster, recommended all-seater stadiums. So we began to have some of the real state-of-the-art stadiums, all-seaters, so it was much, much easier to identify culprits. These people who delight in maybe chanting racist abuse of black players were almost cloaked in, a, um, in anonymity because of the... Um, the crowd, but now they can report it, they can pinpoint the CCTV, can go in and have a look, and if they've got the evidence, they can put them to, take them to court and actually have a, a banning order imposed on them. So CCTV has done a fantastic job. In the control room at Brighton Albion, we can clearly see the footage taken during our tour with Baker. It's video like this that has been used as evidence in some crucial cases which is why CCTV is mandatory at league clubs. Regarding an arrest, it is down to the police. All we can do is gather as much evidence as we can. Um, the CCTV footage can be uh, a very, very good evidence, as can the statements from the stewards. And if you can get statements from supporters who have witnessed it, uh, it's all very good evidence and can lead us to a successful prosecution. OK, so what we'll do is firstly we'll mount the, uh, control, the control lead onto the jacket. And some stadiums are taking CCTV even further, giving their stewards head-mounted cameras. Now, as you can see on the controller, um, so where we actually control the camera and how we actually record, uh, initiate all the recordings and actually control the device itself. Which can give clubs intimate access to incidents in the stadiums. When you actually have um, a steward or a security officer wearing the camera, it captures a different perspective. It's, you're actually able to see through the eyes of the person and experience what they've experienced on the day, rather than the perspective of a CCTV camera where you may not be able to get the full effect of what they actually experienced and how they actually dealt with that situation. And obviously, as you can imagine, it, it does help in capturing um, the full audio and full video to be used uh, in court uh, for evidential purposes. Within the past two decades, the experience of a football match has transformed. It's totally an unrecognisable operation now from, say, going to see a game in the early 80s. But we try and keep it low-key within the stadium and make it a warm and welcoming place to come. And this, we find, diffuses the atmosphere more than provokes anything. Today, spectators and players can be fined, criminally charged and banned for using language that many players had endured for so long. That a person could be banned for three years from entering any football league ground they also have to hand in their passport, they're not allowed to travel on the rail network when certain teams are playing, they're not allowed to travel out of the country when England are playing, and, and basically it's a very strict measure. These changes have been absolutely crucial in reviving the reputation of English football. The game was in danger of being written off. The Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, was thinking of insisting that people needed an ID card to even go to a game. 
that's how serious it was. So it, it wasn't a question of football blaming government or government blaming football, which they tried to. It was a situation where everybody had to, you know, make an input. We want every football club um, wants their club to be well supported. They want to attract families. We don't want to lose the next generation of supporters, the youngsters coming along because of these bigots that will be making comments. So I think by putting the cameras in, it spells out to those that are likely to misbehave that the clubs don't want it, we won't tolerate it, and it should also give confidence to families coming along that the clubs are doing everything within their power to, to eliminate this problem. An inevitable clash between a forward and a defender. In the 58th minute, Liverpool's Uruguayan forward Luis Suarez tackles Manchester United defender Patrice Evra. Four minutes later, Suarez and Evra are seen speaking animatedly. Evra complains to the referee that he's been racially abused by being called a negro, black, by Suarez. A word Suarez later says is used in a friendly way in Uruguay. On November the 16th, the Football Association charges Suarez with misconduct, investigating the incident with additional video footage, witness interviews and linguistic experts. On December the 21st, the FA announces Suarez is found guilty and will be penalised with an eight-match ban and a fine of £40,000. According to its report, Suarez used the word negro seven times during the exchange with Evera. Suarez didn't appeal, but has maintained he didn't do anything wrong, saying, in my country, negro is a word we use commonly, a word which doesn't show any lack of respect and is even less so a form of racist abuse. Based on this, everything which has been said so far is totally false. Just what amounts to racism? And how much does it still permeate football? The head of FIFA, Sepp Blatter, in a CNN interview last year, put it this way. There is no racism. There is maybe one of the players towards the other, uh, he has a word or a gesture which is not the correct one. But also the one who is affected by that, he should say it's a game. We are in a game and the end of the, the game we shake hands, this can happen. Blatter's comments caused a storm. Everyone says in the heat of the moment, uh, you have to blame it on the heat of the moment. Sometimes in the heat of the moment, that, you, know, you, you can do an action or whatever, but on the racism and beyond uh, situation, that's not the heat of the moment. Why is that the first thing that comes into your head in the heat of the moment? It's quite embarrassing. Yeah, you can do a rash tackle or whatever, but um, when you're actually abusing another player, uh, racially and beyond, um, no, it doesn't wash with me and there's no position in, in, in football in sport for that. Blatter later said his comments were misunderstood and that he is committed to the fight against racism. But they revived the debate about just how much progress has been made. It has certainly improved on the football field, it's improved in the stadiums, um, you don't hear as much abuse in the stadiums in, in this country. Um, in the UK as you used to, um, so that, that's improved. But unfortunately, in, in recent years, it's, um, I have to say it's a, it's a conversation that we're having up ever, uh, too regular. And I, I'm, I'm doing these kind of interviews quite a lot now and, and it's starting to annoy me. It would be naive to say it's been eradicated, because it's not, but as you get a civilised society, I hope that sport can play a leading role in making society more civilised. Earl Barrett, a defender who started his career with Manchester City, played through years of abuse, an experience that he doesn't want anyone else to suffer through. Of course, if, if a majority of them fans are, are, are racially abusing you or they're making monkey, monkey chants, um, it echoes around the stadium and that's what happened to me, you know, the monkey chants, got on the ball, monkey chants around, around the stadium, just echoing around the stadium and, and, and that really hurt me and I decided not to say anything, I decided not to say, look, I want something done about this, because I thought I'd be, th I'd be thrown out of the game. But nevertheless, that, that shouldn't have happened, and it, you know, it shouldn't, uh, that, that shouldn't be happening now. 
Uh, those of you who don't know, my name's Earl Barrett, uh, from, the, from Kick It Out. Um, Barrett now volunteers yeah, with Kick It Out, an anti-discrimination campaign started in 1993. It was a response to a wholesale problem with football, which was black players being abused by uh, their white counterparts, both on the pitch and in the stands. And in the early 90s, um, a union of uh, high-profile footballers, such as Garth Crooks, John Fashionu, Paul Elliott, with the backing of the union, uh, and a large number of the clubs came together for a one-off awareness raising campaign to say this has been happening for years uh, and we, we don't want to take this anymore, we want to make a stand. And I think Kick It Out has contributed to that um, feeling of safety that players from across the world have played in England. The English Premier League is now the most watched in the world. But as the Suarez incident shows, cultural perceptions can muddy the waters. In the case with the uh, Suarez from Liverpool, I, you know, my thing is that when you are going to another country, you have to learn the culture, you have to learn the meanings, you know, what do I use, and if I'm going to say things on the film and stuff like that. I mean, I played in Holland, played in uh, all of the uh, different parts of the world, and what I would try to do is to not pick up the words that are going to offend people and pick up the words that are going to be good. You know, so, uh, you know, I, I, I can't feel sorry for him in that circumstances. My advice to him would be, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Even if the playing field looks more diverse, the manager's bench in English football does not. We want football in this country to be played, managed, administered and watched by a cross-section of England. At the minute, we don't have that. Uh, we've got no openly gay players. We've got two black managers from 92, very few Asian players, uh, and a lack of women at boardroom level. So there's an imbalance there, and I think the work that we do across the year with all the clubs and with all the agencies is to try and address that in some way. We'd like to see more uh, black and ethnic minorities in, in, in management positions, not just as a manager of a football club, but in manager of administration, IT, manager of catering, anything that happens um, you know, uh, outside the football industry happens inside the football industry. So, you know, black and ethnic minorities um, in those positions, the positions of of leadership, is would work would work wonders. But even that may never be enough. Inherently, it's about the conditions of indiv individuals' heart. Uh, there's nothing you can uh, uh, you can put all the laws uh, around it, but. Uh, if someone wants to do it from, from the initial ignorance or, or their own heart condition uh, and, uh, and the prejudices and attitudes, I don't think any law can, can stop it. It was more than 40 years ago when Clyde Best made his journey to England to pursue a passion. To play a game he seems to barely recognise today. I think what has happened is that they make so much money now, you know, a lot of them just seem to think that because they're making this money, you know, that's going to take care of everything that I do. Life's not that way, you know, you've got to learn to be humble, you've got to be respectful, you have to learn to behave yourself because your money, you know, doesn't make you a man or make you a de decent human being. You know, you have to practice the things that your parents taught you, you learned in school, your coaches are telling you, and carry them things out. They're, those are the things that are going to make you a better person, not the amount of money that you have in your pocket. And for best, the magic of the game remains undimmed. I think the most important thing to remember about soccer, with all the foolishness that is going on right now with the racism and stuff like that, the minute a goal is scored, I could be as black as the ace of spades, or I can be as white as a snowflake. The minute a goal is scored, everybody hugs one another. And as I said, the most important thing to remember, the ball doesn't care what color you are.